Hey guys, so today we have a bit of a different video, but it's finally going to be something related to my vehicles. My content style and types of videos have changed over the years that I've been on YouTube, but I do have a V6 and V8 charger, and I still like making videos on those from time to time. Now the V8 engine is still being built and that's almost done. I know it's been a very long time, but of course there will be videos on that as soon as it's ready. But today we're doing a V6 video as that's the car that I'm daily driving right now. And I'm going to show this car being dyno tested and tuned. So to make that happen, I've partnered with the guys at International Dino Authority in Ottawa, Ontario. So a huge thanks goes out to the owner Mark, as well as the tuner Wally, both of who had a lot of knowledge and expertise, and also their marketing guy Chris, who helped to bring us all together. So make sure to check out their website and social media if you're interested, all the links will be in the description below. We will also be tuning the Hemi V8 later as well, but we both thought that doing the V6 charger would be really interesting, as I don't think very many people at all would have ever put this car on a dyno, and we did want to see what kind of results this 12 year old 3.5 liter engine would yield. So in this video we'll go over the facility and dyno itself at International Dyno Authority, then we'll look at my car and the specs and also how my bigger wheels and tires affected the output, then we'll look at the dyno process from start to finish and see how things work. So let's begin. So first here's a tour of the facility. This is a dyno only shop that focused on really specializing with the dyno testing and tuning rather than adding any general mechanics in. And remember I will show the entire dyno process itself later in case you guys have never taken your car for a test and you don't know what it's like. International Dyno Authority does tune all platforms, most people only tune one. I was impressed to see that because every computer is different even just between Dodge vehicles. <laughs> As for a little bit of background info on the dyno, when the shop was being built, the floor was excavated 6 feet deep with a 5 foot deep concrete footing and 10 inch tall L-beams on the footing to support the pillow block bearings. Also used were Timken roller bearings due to their ability to handle high speeds for extended periods. Those bearings have a life expectancy of 2 years running 24-7 at 160 km an hour and they're capable of making 8,000 RPMs. Now for the main part of the operation, the Dyno Roller. International Dyno Authority is using a 2,500 pound industrial precision roller with a diameter of 24.5 inches and it's round to within 0.000001 of an inch. This generates 2,278 foot-pounds of inertia, can support a 10-ton vehicle, and can roll up to 8,000 RPMs, which ensures reliable and accurate data. Pair that with the vibration-free bearings and pillow blocks on concrete footings, and the false torque and speed spikes are eliminated, resulting in consistent passes and more accurate fine-tuning. The car itself gets strapped up with tether straps and wheel chocks with tensile strength of over 3,300 pounds. To keep the engine operating temperature down during the testing, there are fans that blow 10,000 cubic feet per minute of air, and the exhaust venting system is constantly replacing that air as it can handle 2000 CFM. International Dyno Authority also had a very awesome engine dyno to go along with a chassis dyno. This was the room that you'll see on screen now. So after an engine is built, it can go on this machine so you can detect leaks, noises and vibrations, safely break in the new engine, evaluate the build under different loads, and optimize power output. So you basically hook up the engine directly and measure the crank horsepower instead of the chassis dyno that measures the horsepower to the wheels. This engine dyno can accommodate both carbureted and fuel injected engines from 300 horsepower all the way to 2000 horsepower. Also unique to the industry, there's a mobile water absorber, meaning that you can test your engine with complete exhaust systems from header to tailpipe. Now that we've got the facility and key components covered, we can go back to the actual testing and tuning process with my vehicle. So we're using my 2009 Dodge Charger SXT with the 3.5 liter V6 engine with over 200,000 miles or 325,000 kilometers on it. 
Again, the whole point of this exercise was to see what this car can do with the dyno, as they are rarely tested and you won't find anything this in-depth on this car on YouTube. The car is rated for 250 horsepower and 250 pound-feet of torque stock, and all I've added to it is a K&N cold air intake and dual cap-packed exhaust, with 2.25 inch dual pipes, one Flowmaster Super 10 single and dual out muffler, and the resonators are deleted. One very important thing to note here is that I've got 22 by 9 inch rims with 265-35 R22 tires in all four corners. These wheels are more for show of course, as I like the visual appearance and this car is definitely not the fastest, but of course they are far heavier than the stock wheels this car came with. So that leads us into the next part of the video, which is how the bigger wheels and tires affect the dyno. This is very important in this case because of the bigger wheels that I'm using. So if we actually look at the weights to have some concrete data here, the Boss 22 by 9 inch rims are 41 pounds per wheel. The Falcon Zyx STZ05 tires on this thing at 265.35 R22 are 37 pounds per tire. So that means a total of 312 pounds for four wheels or 156 pounds for two wheels. The stock wheels that this car came with were 17 by 7, but those are way too small and I've never really used those. So we can go up to uh, the RT stock wheels around this time, which would be 18 by 7.5 inch, and those OEM rims are about 25 pounds per wheel. Then you add some solid tires, so we'll go with the Michelin Defender LTX MS at a size of 235.55 R18 at 30 pounds per tire. So the total for four wheels would be 220 pounds, or for two wheels would be 110 pounds. So that means my setup is 92 pounds heavier for four wheels and 46 pounds heavier for the two driving wheels in the rear. So that'll be important going forward in my calculations. But now we can look at just how these bigger wheels and tires affect the dyno results. So the inertia dyno here is measuring the power to the wheels. So by increasing the amount of the weight that the car has to move, as we've seen, the parasitic loss is also increasing, as it's simply a larger load to the drivetrain. Remember the chassis dyno shows power to the wheels, so that will be less than the horsepower numbers provided by the manufacturer as they are measuring the crank horsepower. So that 250 horsepower for this car is the crank horsepower. The loss is usually between 10 to 18% as you lose power in things like the torque converter, transmission, transfer case, rear differential. That loss is then further increased with heavier wheels. So this inertia dyno works by loading up the wheels a specified amount and seeing how quickly the car can accelerate. And with more power, this will be achieved faster. Because the wheels are accelerating, rotating mass has a huge effect on this, with the bigger wheels and tires adding more inertia, making it more difficult and slower for the car to accelerate, and that results in a lower horsepower output. If we think of it as a concept, it's like putting cement shoes on a runner. The runner still generates a specific amount of power no matter what shoes he's wearing, but with these heavier shoes, more of his power now has to be used to account for them. That means he'll run slower and put less of his power down on the floor. The same thing applies to vehicles. The engine still generates a specific amount of power, but with the heavier wheels, more power has to account for moving them, making the vehicle slower and putting less power down to the wheels themselves. So we'll talk about calculations and how much this directly can affect the results later on in the video. So now we will take a look at the dyno process from start to finish. The vehicle is all strapped up and there's also a wideband jig that's placed at the tailpipe to measure the air to fuel ratio just one of the many parameters that will be adjusted. Again, all the fans are on, trying to keep the engine operating temperature as cool as possible in these conditions. Wally is in the car and does between two to five passes that are very similar, so as to gather a baseline of data. The car is doing the pulls in second gear, and they are using HP tuner software, which is obviously far more complex than anything you can do with a handheld device like a Diablo, and thus it will yield better results. The MPV-12 tuner device is used, plugging into the car's OBD2 port, and that will connect the car to the laptop and transfer data. Here's a quick look at the software, which tells you an extensive amount of data relating to the car after each pass. The first screen is what an actual pass looks like in terms of the data, and the second screen in a few moments shows just about everything that can be edited. The hard part of course is knowing what to change and tweak, and being able to actually read what you're seeing, Everything from airflow to spark to torque management. And of course you can also see some of the real-time data on the screen as things are happening. A few major points here before we continue. We are using an 87 octane tune as this is a daily driver that I rack up a lot of miles on. Also a bit more drivetrain loss than normal should be expected as the engine might be tired and have lower compression due to its age and use of over 200,000 miles. So 
So let's see the first pass. Okay, so here's the chart that you see after each pass, showing you your output. As for the calculation, torque is what actually gets measured, and that combined with speed calculates the horsepower. So the formula is torque times RPM divided by 5,252 equals horsepower. And you will notice that on every chart, both the horsepower and torque curves cross exactly at 5252 RPM every single time. Anyways, the baseline passes showed about 171 horsepower and 182 pound-feet of torque as it is. That would be about a 32% drivetrain loss from the 250 horsepower to the crank, which seems very high. Some of that is due to the older engine which loses power over time, but we also have to take into account the heavier wheels and tires. It's almost impossible to assess the relative loss between wheel setups unless you're running back to back and monitoring the data very closely, but I did find something which I could try to use for estimating purposes. HRE wheels posted on a forum using three different sets of wheels back to back to back on a 2012 Camaro SS. So three different runs. Judging on the weight of the wheels alone, you can see that for every two pounds of weight added to the wheels, roughly one horsepower and one pound foot of torque was lost. This test kind of highlights everything I've said, and HRE concluded that while the engine still cranks out the same amount of power, their lighter wheels waste less of it before it gets to the ground and the gains were across the entire rev range and not just peak. So if we use that calculation to take into account the effects of the rotational inertia and drivetrain losses due to the heavier wheels, with a rough estimate that the extra 46 pounds waste about 0.5 horsepower and torque per pound, then we can add about 23 here, resulting in a baseline of 194 horsepower and 205 pound-feet of torque. Again, that addition is just estimating to try to compensate a bit for the wheels. The car is rated at 250 horsepower, so with this estimate we would see a more realistic drivetrain loss of 22.4% for horsepower. Now let's look at a few more passes and see where we can end up. Now on screen you can see the charts from the 10 passes and how the output gradually rose as the car was tuned. So I drove the car in here with 171 horsepower and 182 pound-feet of torque and drove the car out with 205 horsepower and 231 pound-feet of torque. So that means that the team at International Dyno Authority was able to get a net gain of 35.27 horsepower and 47.72 pound-feet of torque, which are gains of 20.7% and 26.2% when compared with the beginning figure. Using that 205 horsepower and an 18% drivetrain loss, that puts the crank horsepower back at the stock 250. But again, if we account for that extra 46 pounds, giving 23 extra horsepower and torque, the final numbers would be around 229 horsepower and 253 pound-feet of torque. Using an 18% drivetrain loss, that now pushes the crank number up to 279 horsepower, not bad at all and reasonable to me. So that's basically the entire process of these few hours of dyno testing and tuning. So was it worth it? 
Did I feel a difference in the vehicle? My answer is, absolutely I did. First, just leaving the building I was able to chirp the tires on the 22 inch rims, and normally this car can't even make 20s chirps, so that was pretty cool. Driving the car on my long road home, it felt much more responsive, like the car had really woken up, and it was a lot more fun to drive. I especially noted more pull at highway speeds, around 50 to 60 miles per hour, where it felt much quicker to accelerate, but it was also noticeable in the lower speeds as well. And for a comparison, when using my Diablo Sport handheld tuner, the Intune i3, in the past on either this car or my V8, you do notice that difference a little bit once you tune it, but having the car tuned professionally here was a massive step above that in feel. So again, a huge thanks goes out to International Dino Authority for sponsoring this video and making all of this happen on camera. They were super friendly and nice people, but best of all, they were knowledgeable, and this experience has definitely made it a lot more fun to drive my V6 while I count down the days until I can get my 6.5 liter Hemi engine in my Daytona and drive that thing. Also, if nothing else, this does show you that you can have some very decent power gains from a relatively stock vehicle just by a tune. Remember, my Charger only has an intake and catback exhaust, so I really haven't added too much performance-wise, and still saw some solid gains of 34 horsepower and 49 pound-feet of torque. So if you're still watching, that's the end of this video. What did you guys think of seeing this entire process, and did the results of my Charger surprise you? Let me know down in the comment section below. As always, thanks for watching, make sure to like and subscribe for all your Mopar content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.